Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the extra webinar this morning. Uh, my name is Christy Amobi, and I work in the product division of extra. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Heinrich Schigenschmidt from the Radio Oncology Network in Germany to speak with us today regarding x-ray based therapy to treat degenerative disorders. If you have any questions at all at the conclusion of the session, please feel free to reach out to Extral, and we appreciate your attention and time. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Segan Smith. Thank you so much. Welcome to the webinar on radiation therapy for degenerative disorders by Professor Heinrich Segan Schmidt from Germany, presently working at Osnabrück. This webinar is devoted to degenerative disorders. To my person, I can have a long-term vita working at the University of Erlangen, at the Alfred Krupp Hospital in Essen, as a CEO and director of the Cyber Knife Center in Hamburg, and the new founded Strahlen Center Hamburg until 2018. Currently, I'm working as a staff member in radiation oncology and therapy at the Radiation Therapy Radio Oncology Netzwerk MVZ Niedersachsen Osnabrück. Between the period 1995 and 2020, I was founder, co chairman, and driving force of the German Cooperative Group of Radiotherapy for Benign Disorders, GCGBD. Between 1985 and 2020, over 35 years, I have been an author, editor, and co editor of over 15 books and over 150 peer reviewed scientific articles. You find the representative links on PubMed and ResearchGate, where you can download specific articles, which I've published in the past. As a private person, I'm married, have five children in the age of 25 to 37 years. My hobbies are sports, walking, music, and gardening. The history of radiation therapy of benign disorders starts almost two years after the detection of X-rays in 1897. At that time, Leopold Freund from Vienna detected that radiation of painful joints would uh, alleviate pain. So he started, besides several other applications, to research on the effects of low-dose radiotherapy. However, at that time, no idea about doses, concepts were present. Leopold Freund later in 1903 published the first textbook on X-ray therapy with more than 70% of the articles dealing with radiotherapy for non-malignant disorders or so-called benign disorders. This had a long-term consequence for radiation therapy and oncology. In Germany, the radiologist Günther von Panewitz, who became 87 years old and was a chief radiation physician at the community hospital in Bielefeld, researched over 40 years on the topic of benign diseases. And he was the one who on hundreds and thousands of patients established the low dose concepts of radiotherapy for different benign disorders, including degenerative disorders. He grouped the benign diseases into degenerative inflammatory, hyperproliferative, and functional disorders. He, his last publication was from the year 1970. In 2007, Myself and other authors published the book Radiotherapy for Non-Malignant Disorders, the first full textbook on the issue on non-malignant disorders. In addition, our national cooperating group 
was working on guidelines for radiotherapy for non-malignant disorders, which were published in 2015 and in 2018 on an international level and can be found in the literature. The major question using radiation therapy for non-malignant disorders is the question of can radiotherapy at low doses induce malignant disorders or leukemia? This question clearly depends on the age of the patient, the organ and region which has been irradiated, and the specific organ dose. In rare cases, low-dose radiotherapy can indeed induce malignant tumors, or very rarely, if the radiation hits the gonades, even hereditary diseases. So protective measures have to be considered at any age and have to be discussed with the specific patient and at the specific situation radiation is applied. The risk at low dose RT, however, can be only determined in theory and mathematically, but not with proven long-term epidemiological studies of high value. Usually, we can assume that humans at the age of over 50 years can have cancers induced by low doses uh, up to 10 gray in, approx in approximately 0.1% within 30 years. However, for humans below 30 years, always a critical consideration should be taken into account. However, comparison with risks from other therapies for specific indication should be allowed and compared with the risks of radiotherapy. Here are the figures from the Bayer NRPD and ICRP reports related to age and gender related to the risks of inducing cancer. Here on this graph it can be seen that for the first three decades the risks is higher up to tenfold risking cancer when low doses radiotherapy has been applied. However, at the age of 30 to 40, so in the fourth decade, the rates drop below the average for the whole um, uh, population. The risk is slightly, slightly higher for females than for males. The highest cancer risk is for in the first and second decade, so for these patients and possible clients, radiation therapy should be usually excluded for benign conditions. At the year of 30, uh, they reach average values and should be carefully considered. At 50 years, the risk is only 50% of the average and even drops more at the age of 70, 80. So at older age groups, radiation is much less critical and only less than 0.1% after 30 years. So the appropriate indication for radiotherapy is usually that a diagnosis should be affirmed, a physical impairment by the disease is present, and other treatment methods or previous, radio, uh, previous therapies are not working and are without effect. If more invasive measures like surgery are still indicated, Radiotherapy may be an option to avoid these higher invasive measures. So the optimal patient selection is shown at this graph. At the age of less than 30 years, no radiotherapy should be given, despite some exceptions for exceptional cases. At the age of 30 to 50 years, other therapies should be used first. And only if these conventional treatments fail, radiotherapy should be used. At the age of over 50 years, the early use of radiotherapy is meaningful and can be even first part uh, before using invasive measures. With regard to chronic pain, some facts and figures. 
10 to 20 percent of the German population or let's say Western population will suffer from chronic pain. In a population of 80 million, these are 8 to 16 million people. The main cause of pain lies in the musculoskeletal system. Usually 43% of the patients await more than one year until an appropriate diagnosis has been made. 20% can no longer practice their professional work or, under, uh, or have leisure activities which they like to do. 40% will have negative effects on their private lives and overall quality of life. Only 50% of the family practitioners are fully informed about the long-term treatment options of chronic pain, including the options of radiotherapy. Six to 10% of the total health costs are spent for chronic pain, which results to an economic burden of 20 to 30 billion euros in Germany per year. Which areas are mostly affected by muscular skeletal system pain? Usually the column, the cervical column, the thoracic column and the lumbar column are involved in about 25% of all cases. In this area, radiotherapy for non-malignant disorders is not indicated due to the possible danger of inducing leukemia in the bone marrow, which is the content of the column bodies, bone bodies. However, there are also other sites like the shoulder, the elbow, the hip, the knee, and the foot joints. In all these joints, arthrosis and arthritis, or tendinosis and tendinitis, or bursitis and insertion tendinopathy can occur. Usually associated with a joint, you have insertion zones from tendons, from muscles into tendons, and from tendons into bone. At joints, usually bursae smooth the movement and make soft movements without uh, any problems possible. And you have bones forming joints which can be overused and can deteriorate so bone can touch bone and arthrosis will have to be um, the major cause for pain. The inflammation of joints and soft tissue can affect bones, cartilage, soft tissues and is driven by immune competent cells, fibroblasts, and the extracellular matrix. When a typical pain and damage of tissue occurs, here is the German wording, several types of cytokines are promoted and mediators like prostaglandin, leukotriene, histamine, serotonin, bradykinin, and other um, cytokines affect and induce reactions into the tissue, which causes reddening, swelling, pain, and temperature increase in the area and uh, disturbed function. The inflammation in itself is then driven by the neutrophil granulocytes or the mononuclear cells, which mitigate and trans are transferred from the vessels, the capillaries, into the tissue where the damage has occurred. This process undergoes several steps like margination, this is stopping at the endothelium, the adhesion, the docking onto the endothelium, and the emigration into the tissue surrounding the capillaries, and the marching along the chemotaxin gradients towards the region of cellular and regional tissue damage. There are two dose-dependent effects of radiation therapy. 
the known effect of high doses, high single doses and high total doses towards cancer treatment are well known. Usually single doses of point uh, of two gray up to 60, 70 and 80 gray are known effects which cause the cells to die, undergo apoptosis or are not anymore able to um, proliferate. However, on the other side, we have low dose effects which can cause mitigation of inflammation. So these two sides of radiotherapy with different effects are important to consider when we use radiotherapy for non-malignant disorders. The mechanisms and actions of low-dose radiation therapy are summarized here. Anti-inflammatory, effects on mononuclear cells of the immune system, inhibition of local endothelial cells of capillaries, inhibition of the effect of pro-inflammatory cytokines, and inhibition of the subsequent inflammatory cascade which takes place into the tissue causing swelling and pain and edema. The rationale and indication of using radiation therapy for non-malignant disorders is usually not a primary and first treatment. There are several reasons not to use radiotherapy as the first treatment choice. It is only then if other treatments are ineffective and have not alleviate pain and have not improved function. So no treatment options like permanent pain or function loss and social effects of pain may be the primary driving forces to use radiotherapy to improve these situations. Lack of effect of con conventional therapies for about three to six months with immobilization and no relief, causing muscle atrophy, or ineffective oral and invasive medications like injections, which risk of abuse, or with side effects due to analgesic medication, or ineffective physiotherapy, electrotherapy, ultrasound and shock waves may be reasons to use radiotherapy. And in addition, other more invasive therapies might have higher risks than radiotherapy, including surgery. So these are reasons which give the chance that radiation therapy can be used as part of a multidisciplinary concept, including physiotherapy, surgery, medication, change in nutrition, and change in the physical body activities. So we starting with arthrosis and arthritis. The major symptom is pain and long-term effects with deterioration of the joints, with function disturbance, loss of professional and leisure activities, loss of social interactions and change in quality of life. The possible sites which can be affected with radiation are the shoulder, elbow, hand and finger joints, hip joint, knee joint and foot joint. Here is a summary of possible indications at these regions, including not only arthrosis, but also later treated or later addressed uh, Bursae and tendon. On the shoulder joint, we usually call this omartosis. On the elbow joint, we can have, besides the artrosis, the tennis and golf or elbow syndrome. At the hand, wrist, and finger joints, we have the special situation of Ritz artrosis at the thumb and the polyarthrosis of fingers. At the hip joint, we can treat the cox arthrosis, but also in connection with a hip joint replacement and uh, implant of a uh, full, uh, full joint implant, the heterotopic ossification prophylaxis.
at the knee joint, we can treat GON and patellar arthrosis at the foot joint, the upper and lower ankle joint arthrosis, the foot root and the forefoot and toe arthrosis. The arthrosis is usually graded in a four scale grading system. At the first grade, you see a subchondral sclerosis. In the second, you see the narrowing of the bones, you see irregularities of the joint surfaces, and you see the formation of osteophytes. At grade three, the osteophytes become much larger. The narrowing of the bones and the smaller uh, joint areas are very significant, which shows that the chondral components of the joints are deteriorating even more. And at grade four, the bones of the two joints can touch each other. The components of the bones are deformed. And um, you may see uh, structural defects in the bones underneath the joint surfaces. On the next uh, example, the arthrosis of the elbow, you can see the irregular surfaces, especially in the medial part of the joint. And you see also the enlarging of the joint surface itself. Here on the hip joint, you see the sclerosis of the acetabulum, barely seen joint, and you see the osteophyte on the lateral component. And again here on the hip joint. So typical examples of arthrosis. On the shoulder, you see the narrowing in the lower part of the shoulder joint with large osteophytes and the narrowing of the joint surfaces. Here on the upper ankle joint, you see deformation, structural damages, uh, dissolution of bone with more or less uh, artificial uh, joint formation, which disables the human to actually move the joint in this area. Here on the fingers, which we call the polyarthrosis, you can see typical distal and proximal arthrosis, which we call dip and pip joint arthrosis. And here on the metacarpal phalangeal joints, the MCP arthrosis. The typical arthrosis at the thumb occur usually at the MCP joint of the first digit. It can also affect a neighboring bones and the hand wrist on the radial part itself. This is an example of a female of 53 years, which is a physiotherapist and plays piano, which already has different ankled fingers at the dip joints here, and also swelling in some of the proximal finger joints. With different types of arthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis, polyarthritis, or goiter, uh, or other systemic disorders, the distribution of the arthrosis can be quite different. So in some situation, the full hand with all finger joints and hand joints have to be irradiated for pain reduction. Here is the example of Ritz arthrosis, which is the arthrosis of the first digit in the thumb area. It can affect the so-called PIP joint and the MCP joint. And in addition, the trapezoid joint and uh, bones in the hand root and the scaphoid. So depending on the amount of arthrosis, the radiation field has to be small or extended to all affected joints at the thumb 
and hand wrist. Usually with this syndrome, daily functions are heavily disabled, grip can be weakened. Here is the typical radiation field, which is performed, including the two thumb joints, the PIP joint, the MCP joint, and the STT joints. On the other hand, fingers may be so much deformed that usually an effect of radiation therapy may not be expected. Nevertheless, even those patients with heavily distorted joints may have an effect in up to 50% from radiation therapy. Usually, radiation therapy is given in six to eight radiotherapy sessions with a very low dose of 0.5 gray, usually applied two to three times per week, and possibly repeated in a second series about 8 to 12 weeks following the first radiotherapy series. Full evaluation is usually possible after three months, so no immediate and acute effects can be expected. It may be even possible that the initial pain is increased by the effects of radiation therapy, which changes the milieu of the joint and the tissue from acid to basic. Here a typical example of radiation therapy is shown. Fingers number two, three and four are treated at the PIP joints. You can see the light field. The patient itself can observe the proper positioning of the treatment field, which is also documented on a sketch taken before initiating radiotherapy. For those treatments, again, six to eight radiotherapy sessions, two to three times per week, possibly repeated in a second series, are applied. Other examples of radiation to finger joints are shown here. You can see here a partial hand radiotherapy for digits D1 to D3 and an only finger radiotherapy field for D2 to D4 and D5 at the PIP joints. So individualization of radiotherapy can be done and is important to reduce those to uninvolved areas which are not painful, are not functionally uh, disabled. Polyarthrosis of foot joint often affects the first toe, which is also called hallux valgus, but may also affect other toe joints. A typical example of pain is the hallux valgus at some point in time when the deviation is very large, the operation may go up front and radiation may follow, but oftentimes radiation is the primary treatment. In such a severe case, radiation therapy is possibly not the first choice. Here, the joint fusion or an artificial joint insertion is possible. In this instance, the joint can still move. Sometimes radiation therapy may be performed at a later time point when pain is still present. We are going to the upper joints here, the shoulder. You can see here a three-dimensional treatment planning for the shoulder joint, which addresses the whole capsule of the joint. And this should be usually the target volume, not just the areas where the bones touch each other, but the full capsule, because the capsule will be irritated and can have effusive uh, and can induce swelling into in the synovia. Here, the example for the knee joint is shown. Again, the full knee is irradiated because of the inflammation of the full capsule content in the knee joint. 
Here an example of radiation therapy of painful gonadotropin. In Germany, we performed a so-called patterns of care study between 2006 and 2008. A total of 238 radiation therapy institutions answered. This is 96%. Of those, 80% were treating painful gonadotropin with low-dose radiotherapy. Per year, a total of 4,500 patients were treated. Of those, 90% had acute pain, while 95% had chronic pain. Refractory pain was noted in 81% before radiotherapy. The median applied total dose was 6 gray, so mostly in one series. However, there were also up to 30% who received second doses, second RT series, up to 12 gray. The distribution of the radiation technique was 25% auto-voltage therapy and 80% linear accelerator radiotherapy. 42 radiation therapy institutions provided outcome data with long-term outcome in up to 5,000 patients. The median pain reduction in these patients for more than three months was achieved in 60% of the patient, depending within the institutions, a range of 5 to 100%. And 40% of those had pain relief more than 12 months and permanent pain relief in 28%. So this effect at least would help patients to overcome the question to get an artificial knee joint. These patients were delayed in their invasive surgical procedure. In, in conclusion, radiotherapy for painful gonadotropin has been shown to be effective without side effects and should always be a th therapeutic option before using surgery as an intervention. We are now going to the second group of indications, the inflammation of the bursa, which we call bursitis. Again, this is a pain syndrome, which is accompanied by swelling of the area and function disturbance, which may affect professional and leisure activities and quality of life. Typical areas are those which we have already addressed for arthrosis, namely shoulder, elbow, hand, hip, knee, and foot. At the shoulder, we can often see a so-called bursitis calcarea, which is associated with calcification in the joint. At the elbow, we can have the bursitis olecrani, which is also called student's elbow. At the hip joint, we see the most often occurring trochanteric bursitis or bursitis trochanterica. In sports, we often see bursitis prepatillaris, and in older patients and in sports, people we also see bursitis subachillea. Overall, in the human body, we have more than 100 bursae, so other sites can also be affected by bursitis. Usually, the causes are trauma in sports, ice hockey, wrestling, or overuse and extreme strain, especially professional and leisure activities like tilers, roofers, or shot put and jumping may cause this bursitis of the knee or the elbow. Local infections like micro or macro trauma or other effects can induce bursitis. The possible treatments are immobilization, cooling agents, ointments or sprays, and the application of anti-inflammatory drugs like enzymes or coxide drugs. I show you several examples. For example, the painful elbow syndrome can be seen as a local swelling an inflammation, which is extrusive, here seen, 
when you are leaning longer time on your elbow, that's why it's called student's elbow. This can even induce bone growth, as you can see here, a large osteophyte on the elbow joint of the ulnar bone. So acute pain, swelling and heat symptoms are typical symptoms and in x-rays you might see calcified second bursitis. At the knee, we can have three locations. Above the patella, in front of the patella and underneath the patella. Shown here, suprapatella, here and here behind the patella tendon. Usually this painful inflammation and swelling cause, is caused by acute trauma, fall on the knee or chronic overuse sports, especially as I already mentioned, shot put or jumping disciplines, or sometimes even due to local infection, foreign body or an insect bite. At the hip joint, we can differentiate three painful hip syndromes. The lateral hip syndrome, usually caused by the trochanteric bursa, trochanteric bursitis cord. But you can also have on the minor trochanteric bone, the medial or gluteus minus, medius bursa inflammation. And on the ischiatic bone, you can have the ischial gluteal bursa with pain in direction of the backside of the knee, here at the inner side of the calf and here on the outside of the calf going down to the knee and even lower. As these bursae are soft tissues and cause edema, the areas are usually much better seen in the MRI. So magnetic resonance imaging is the leading diagnostic tool. And here in comparison to the uninvolved left side on the right side, not only the surface of the trochanter region, but also the muscles inserting into the zones are shown to be affected by the inflammation and shown by edema. And usually, all these inflammatory components should be included in the radiation therapy field. Here, an example is shown for the so-called lateral hip view. While for the artrosis of the hip, the radiation field is the medial radiotherapy field, as you can see here, the hip bone. This is a very simple APPA opposite radiation field technique. It could be more localized by an additional third field coming from the site. There is a good clinical study by Bouldevieco published in the British Journal of Radiology in 2017, who showed that in 60 patients with recurrent trochanteric bursitis after insufficient effect of all conventional therapy options, low dose radiotherapy of 10 times 1 gray in the first series and 10 times 0.3 gray in the second RT series were effective and evaluated at 1 and 4 months and 12 months post radiotherapy. They used two criteria a visual analog scale of pain assessment and the necessary required analgesic drug consumption. Overall, they achieved a 62% improvement according to the visual analog scale criterion. The pain scale fell from 8 to 4 in average at 4 months. And there was a stable improvement for 70% of the patient over two years remaining. This is the full paper shown in the British Journal of Radiology in 2017. Tendinosis and tendinitis is the third group of soft tissues which can be affected by degenerative disorders. Inflammation of the tendon itself and the insertion zones of the tendon 
into the muscle or into the bone may be the reason. Like a rope, the tendons are grouped in very small components, larger components, and the component of the full tendon itself. The tendon itself has no perfusion, and so they can be damaged, and the repair comes from the bone and from the muscle perfusion. This is a typical example of the biceps muscle, which inserts into the lower arm and comes from the shoulder itself. So this is the composition of a tendon, and the damage can occur in single components, larger components, and partial uh, ruptures of the full tendon. This has to be considered because radiation therapy will not repair this damage, but can be taken to repair the smaller components. An already ruptured or partially ruptured tendon will not be repaired. However, with better perfusion, these smaller components can be repaired. Painful insertion and tendon disorders occur at the shoulder, at the supraspinatus and biceps muscles, at the elbow. They are called tennis and golfer elbow syndrome, at the hip joint, the so-called tractus iliotibialis syndrome, at the knee joint was the patella tendon and patella tip syndrome, and at the foot called achillotinia and plantar and dorsal heel spur syndrome. The painful shoulder syndrome, or also called impingement syndrome, is due to the fact that the tendon of the biceps goes underneath the tendons of the shoulder roof, and by inflammation, the swelling causes the tendon to be hampered by the flexion movement, uh, thereby causing pain underneath the shoulder bones. On the other hand, swelling of the bursa can also cause pain for the biceps muscle movement. Another problem is the insertion zone of the muscular supraspinatus, which attaches here on the area, which is in opposite to the insertion of the biceps, which is going towards the arm. And again, a bursa and a tendon can calcify during a chronic inflammatory process and thereby hampering movement and causing pain. This is the insertion of the flexion or extension muscles at the arm, called tennis or golfer's elbow. Here, the muscles pull onto the insertion zone of the tendons at the humerus bone. And this is the typical grip of a tennis player who feels that pain. Immobilization is, and cooling is one of the best choices to perform. Shockwave therapy and analgesic medication may also be helpful. But in addition, local radiation therapy with six times 0.5 gray up to three gray in the first series, eventually repeated after 12 weeks, are the typical treatments which are done today. Painful knee syndrome due to an insertion inflammation of the patella tendon can be seen here with the uh, light areas in the patella tendon indicating edema and water content. And usually here, the radiation therapy encompasses the full of, uh, tendon. Uh, so the upper component of the patella, the patella itself, and the lower components of 
the tendon should be included. Finally, we have the painful foot syndrome. The painful foot syndrome can occur due to a plantar, a dorsal, heel spur, or due to achillodynia itself, or due to the inflammation of the calcaneus. With overuse, sometimes bone bruise and stress fracture can occur in the calcaneus. Acute and chronic pain syndromes with inflammation of tendons and the insertion zones cause functional disturbance. Patients may not be able to walk over longer distances or stand or even sit. The therapeutic options are a better weight distribution into the shoes by using insoles, giving local injections, preferably cortisone, applying shock waves with ultrasound, or physiotherapy. The final options are the local resection of these spurs, thereby preventing the pain induced by uh, pushing these spurs against muscles and soft tissues. Local radiation therapy is given usually with 6 to 8 times 0.5 gray up to doses of 3 to 4 gray, eventually repeated after 12 weeks in a second series. These are typical examples of radiation fields for a plantar heel spur, for the calcaneodynia, and for a smaller field here in the lower part. Here are the typical 3D planning systems which can be nowadays performed when using linear accelerators for treatment. Important for the success evaluation is the evaluation of pain. This can be done in a visual analog scale in colors like green, yellow, red, or by figures, or by summing up the figure values in typical type pain like pain at onset, pain at night, pain during the day, or pain while moving. So the follow-up evaluation success can be determined by a reduced pain symptoms in follow-up, improved function and movement ranges, improved daily activities and functions, the restart of preferred professional and leisure activities, reduced consumption of analgesic medication, and the avoidance of other more invasive procedures like surgery or joint replacement procedures. It is also important to consider that psychosocial effects and motivations with improved movement and less pain are important to affect quality of life in the individual patient. So in summary, we can say low-dose radiation therapy is very effective for painful inflammatory disorders of the bones, joints, tendons, and soft tissues, including bursae. It takes place on an interdisciplinary basis in consultation with specialists like orthopedists, surgeons, pain therapists, and the family doctor and the patient himself so should always be involved in the decision-making process. The possible side effects of X-ray stimulation therapy are low compared to many other conventional therapies, including medications with uh, stomach ulcers occurring on a long-term basic use of anti-inflammatory drugs or surgical complications after surgery or muscle atrophy for long-term immobilization of a joint or a muscle. Thank you very much for sharing and joining the webinar on radiation therapy for degenerative disorders, looking beyond the horizon of malignant disorder and radiation therapy in oncology.
Okay, thank you, Dr. Um, Dr. Shegan Schmidt. I do see a couple of questions in the questions tab. Um, which conditions lend themselves to orthovoltage as a method of treatment delivery? Okay, um, the limitation of orthovoltage is uh, the, um, let's say, the diameter of the lesion to be treated. Uh, if you see bursitis trochanterica, for example, is a limitation whenever you have a very thick patient and you can't just attach a field from the side to reach out to the depth. So usually uh, penetration depths of 10 to 12 uh, centimeters are beyond the practical uh, dose, uh, dose distribution which is then more optimal with a linear accelerator. So small knees, but not uh, large knees can be treated with orthovoltage, but uh, if you go beyond 10, 12 centimeters, uh, the orthovoltage beam may be less favorable in terms of equal distribution of dose. Okay. Um, the second but question- But any small joint, like fingers, hands, shoulders, can be done with both techniques. Okay, thank you. The second question is related to the patients um, who have been, have you seen treated with this, um, with this modality? Are there particular patient groups who seem to have a better or prolonged treatment response? Yes, uh, a very favorable fact is usually the time from onset of pain to treatment. If this time is less than six months, usually patients are benefiting more from the radiation treatment than if you come after four or five years of chronic pain syndrome. This is due to the fact that pain usually becomes a central, in the, um, a problem in the central nerve system. So oftentimes, even the pain may be gone, it is still represented in our uh, in our pain memory. So we should avoid to have pain situation more than a year and then to be treated because this memory effect may still be present and may uh, prevail despite uh, successful radiation therapy treatment. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, there are two more questions. Um, the next one, are there any plans uh, for further clinical trials? Um, the problem with clinical trials is that you have to select the appropriate population. We had clinical trials with diffuse populations and we had very good clinical trials with very small patient settings, like the Dutch study, which was done in the knee and in the finger joints. However, at very advanced stages, as I pointed out, the results there are probably around 30%, 40%. But uh, if you take into account or if you calculate a randomized study where you want to gain an advantage of 30 to 40%, this is an unrealistic um, uh, success rate, which then would fail. And this was indeed the situation for the two Dutch studies. They failed to prove the effect of radiotherapy. However, most of the patients we treat are not in that advanced stage as the Dutch cases have been uh, to, to begin with, with radiotherapy. Okay, I understand. So randomized studies are uh, the, a, a big question uh, in a situation where in a country the treatment itself is already approved, is a grown experience, while in a country where the treatment is not accepted, randomized studies are much more easier to perform. So uh, to speak clearly, in Germany, the reimbursement for treatment for uh, these types of disorders is very usual and common. It's not questioned at all. Um, so it is much more difficult for us to perform randomized studies. But on the other hand, we had studies like in the heel spur situation, and we could clearly prove that a comparison between dose of 0.1 gray versus 1 gray showed significant better results for the 1 gray group than for the 0.1 gray group. And 
in a second setting when the patients was, were not successfully treated with 0.1 gray were switched over to the one gray group, they became as similar as successful as before those who had received one gray to begin with. So we have a study by um, um, from Homburg from Professor Niewald, uh, which just had this design and proved success versus a very, very low or more or less no dose versus a dose of one gray. And we have a lot of randomized studies done from the University of Erlangen, where they compared 0.5 gray versus one gray in chronic cases. And they again could show that the response rate was equal between two dose groups. So we are nowadays always starting with 0.5 gray in our first and second series. Okay, thank you. The last question or the final question, um, the use of radi uh, radiotherapy for benign diseases seems to have renewed interest in Europe. And the question is, what do you contribute this to? What contributed? Yes, what do you think has tr contributed to this? Um, I think uh, we, especially in Germany, have done a tremendous amount of basic clinical research collecting data in so-called patterns of care studies and presenting our guidelines also to the national and international audience. And uh, in non-degenerative disorders like Dupuytra or Lederhose disease, it is the conviction of the patient themselves who report about their success rates and then gain other lay persons around them also to try radiation therapy. In Germany, we can still differentiate between Strahlentherapy and Radio-Oncology, which would mean in uh, the US with having just the radiation oncologist as the profession, while the radiation therapist is the person who acts with the, uh, with the machine. Uh, they can't have the contribution of radiotherapy to be the therapy for non-malignant disorders, and radiation oncology to be the treatment for the malignant disorder. So it is also a termination and it's also an educational problem. If you don't treat patients, you can't educate younger doctors to use radiation therapy as pain uh, treatment. So that has to be changed in the, in the training program for the younger radiation oncologist in Spain. All right. Okay. Well, that is it for the questions here today. Uh, thank you again, um, Dr. Schickenschmidt, for your participation in this event. Um, and thank you to thank everyone you. who was able to attend today. Uh, we will, as I mentioned, be um, distributing not only a recording in, in German, but also a recording in English at a future date. So again, thank you so much, everyone, for your participation. And with that, I will close the session.